we're going to the top so we didn't have a car. Mm -hmm. So we're going to the top so we'll fare. Uh, so we walked over to the end of the train. Right. Train stopped along that uh, northern gate. Right. And it went south. And then we then the train came back. I think it was a special some sort of, because it was there fairly late. For right. The day, you know, I always thought that it was a shame that they didn't make more use of the railroad to bring people to the fair, because it's right there. I mean, oh, I walk know. Oh, 100 right. yards and you're right. in there. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it couldn't have been more convenient, but... Because this is back in the 1930s. Sure. And then uh, my great-grandparents were buried in Boston. And on, before Memorial Day, we always went up there to decorate the grave, mm -hmm. took the train up to East Boston and got out. Walked up people road to the, to the you know, cemetery in right. the summer. And uh, after we finished, uh, we walked back and get the train for new reports. I mean, I guess it was the next train. Sure. It seems so. We didn't have to wait long. Right. The couple of the end was just walked the devil. Right. Yeah. Did anybody here ever ride a freight train? All right. Went up and asked the crew and said, Could I ride in the cab or could I ride in the caboose? And yeah, we did that for campus a couple of times, which produced some of those pictures over there. Well, the kids used to go to, go to Dan and go to the movies and they'd ride home on the 10 o'clock break. Okay. Yeah. They jumped the break, ride home on the 10 o'clock break. Right. 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 Well, some of us then have had some personal experiences with the trains here, and that's a good thing, and they've been gone all this time since 1977, so as time goes on, fewer people are going to be remembering what it was like. People are going to pass away, unfortunately. And so, you know, we depend on things like the tape that we're going to show later, and talks like this and these pictures to bring this to a generation that's coming along and never saw the trains here. So I think that's why it's important, so I'd be all for having a follow-up. As Joe mentioned, I think it's, it's critical to get as much down as we can from the people that remember it while they're still here. You know, you were saying about the fairgrounds. I think every year they ran a special for the fairgrounds. Up until about when? Because I never remember. Up until about 47 or okay. 48. Yeah. Uh, because the last one, they took it uptown. After they dumped everybody off down in the fairgrounds, they took it up down the thing to rail. Great. And, you know, so that was the end of that. Mm -hmm. But I can remember as a kid, of course, the guys were all there. We had to go through them all, take right. a look and see what it all looked like. Sure. And, uh, but yeah, they used to run them up every year. And like I said, they'd take them out and dump them off on Maple Street. Mm -hmm. and that sure. Way. Very convenient. Okay. As far as the the lines that made up the Newbyport Railroad, there were actually four of them. Uh, there was the original Newbyport Railroad from Newbyport to Georgetown. Then there was the Georgetown Branch Railroad from Bradford on the d &M's main line across the river from Haverhill that went down to Georgetown. So now you had a little crescent from Newbyport down through Georgetown and up to Bradford. Then you had the Danvers and Georgetown Railroad, which ran between, guess what? Danvers and Georgetown. Right there. And then the Danvers Railroad, which ran between Danvers and what became Wakefield Junction on the main line. And that was obviously the route that they would take into Boston on Boston and Maine once you got to Wakefield. All of those lines uh, were leased to the Boston and Maine eventually because uh, they could see that here was an opportunity to get into the territory of the Eastern Railroad, which we'll get into in a minute. And also because these four struggling little companies pretty much ran out of money before they even finished the railroad. Stock subscriptions were not what they had hoped they would be, and so they were so in debt that uh, the B&M actually stepped in and awarded them some loans so that they could finish building the railroad. The Eastern Railroad had built through from Boston to Portsmouth around 1841, and they went right through Newbyport. This is the current line today, which is the commuter rail. that goes to Newbyport, but back then it went all the way through to Portsmouth and then on through to Portland, Maine, and points even north of that. And so from 1841, you had pretty good train service into Boston from Newbyport. But some of the folks in Newbyport, especially the businessmen, weren't too happy because the Eastern was kind of raking them over the coals for 
the rates they were charging. So they were dissatisfied and they started to look around <coughs> to see if there wasn't some other way to get into Boston with their goods. And after a few meetings, they decided to try and charter a line. It would take them first to Georgetown and then over into Bradford where they could meet up with the B&M. And &M. they'd also have a line from there to Lawrence with all its mills and, and factories. So that was the first beginnings of, of having another line competing with the Eastern Railroad, and that was called the New Report Railroad. The Georgetown Branch Railroad was chartered on March 11, 1844 to run from Bradford to Georgetown Corner. I'm assuming Georgetown Corner is Georgetown, the center of what it is today as we know it. I've never heard anything called Georgetown Corner, but <coughs> we assume it's right there in the middle of Georgetown. Two years later, the Newbyport Railroad was chartered to run from Newbyport to Georgetown Corner. So now, as I say, you have this crescent. Neither line was begun until three years later, though, and that was uh, February 15, 1849, when they actually broke ground to begin working on these two lines. As I said, support was lacking, even though the newspapers were behind this right from the get-go. Uh, they wanted many people to sign up for stock subscriptions as they could get, and the newspapers supported them, and several editorials came right out and said, you know, we've got to get behind this, folks. This is a way to, to make our towns more prosperous. But the old Yankee farmers weren't about to part with any bucks that they didn't have to, and they kept passing that hat around, and the hat kept coming back empty. They weren't able to sell much in the way of stock subscriptions, and as I said, they didn't even have enough money to finish the lines. Uh, when they started out, and when it came time to purchase rail, which at that time most rail came from England, it was imported because it was a higher quality steel, and there was no money to pay for it. This is great. Now you've got a right of way all graded, you're all ready to go, no rail. So that's when the, the Boston and Maine, who've been watching all this very closely, said, You know, we'll step in and we'll, we'll give you some money to get the rail and get this thing together, and, and then we'll talk. So they were able to get it together and get it finished. Regular service from New Report to Georgetown began on Thursday, May 23, 1850. And the line to Bradford uh, from Georgetown was not completed until a year later in 1851. The entire route was about 15 miles and had cost a total of $225,000, uh, which worked out to about $15,000 a mile. Doesn't sound like a whole lot today, but it was big bucks back in the 1850s. Not two months had gone by when they had their first accident, and that happened on July 18, 1850, when a train struck a cow and derailed, and in so doing, the conductor, Benjamin Hilliard, uh, seeing that uh, the train was about to tip over, or he thought it was going to, leaped off the platform of the first coach into the bucket brush, but unfortunately the car derailed and then ran over him. So he was killed. But he was the first fatality. And again, this was just barely two months after the line opened. Conditions were very primitive. Uh, you know, railroading was, a, was a, a work in progress back then. And early locomotives especially were not like this one. Uh, they were very crude. They burned wood. And that wood uh, had to be sawed to two foot lengths so it could be pitched into the firebox. And it used hundreds and hundreds of cords a year. And these had to be cut continuously. The trees harvested, cut, stacked in cords, and, and usually in wood sheds. And these were kept in various stations along the line so that at any point the train could stop and wood up. And quite often in those days, they would get all the passengers off the train to help throw wood up onto the tender. Because it took 20 minutes or more to fill the tender full of wood because they pile it way up high, higher than the cab roof because it used so much wood. Wood does not generate nearly the heat that coal does. Brakes on the locomotives were, were never worked very well. They're very crude. Usually it involved simply uh, tightening the handbrake on the tender <coughs> on these early locomotives. And at the same time, the engineer would whistle a certain signal for the brakeman on the train turn down the brake wheels on the coaches or on the freight cars behind the engine, and eventually this whole contraption would slow to a stop, hopefully. And uh, in emergencies, if they really have to stop fast, the engineer might pull back the reverse lever and give it a little throttle and, and make the wheels spin backwards a little bit. 
that would help to slow it down some, but not much. So stopping took a good half mile in the best of circumstances. So an emergency like something on the track was, you know, forget it. Livestock wandered onto the track at will, and pedestrians almost as often because there were no fences along the right of way in the early days. And cows were struck regularly, sometimes two or three in a trip. And even though they'd been seen a half a mile ahead, by the time they got the brakes on and got stopped, they'd usually banged into the poor thing. And this is where cow catchers came from. They had those wooden stave pilots that stuck way out in front of the engine. This one has a a much smaller version of that. As they evolved later on, they got basically just a knock blocks and things off the trash. But in the early days, they were great long pointed affairs made out of wooden staves. And they were called by the people cow catchers because that's basically what they did was knock cows off the track before they went under the wheels and derailed the engine. The real name for that is a pilot, which has no relationship to what it was supposed to do. But anyway, that's, that's the real name of those things. In addition to livestock and people wandering on the track, you had washouts after sudden rains, <coughs> tree branches that fell off of, of trees overhead, uh, broken rails were not unknown. Uh, all these were routine hazards of, of these early operations. In the first year of operation, the line carried 31,850 <coughs> passengers. Now that's amazing. Think of this territory today. And imagine what the population was like and how how rural it was then. And they carried 31,850 passengers that first year. There's no record of how much freight was carried that first year, but since they really weren't uh, connected to the, the rest of the line except that little piece into Bradford, uh, there probably wasn't a whole lot of freight carried at that point because you just had a couple of shoe factories up in Georgetown. And that was about the limit to the freight that was been coming and going. So that first year wasn't a big year for freight. 31,850 passengers, that's a lot of folks. At this point, the Danvers and Georgetown Railroad was chartered to connect this, this uh, crescent, as we have it, to go south. And this was to operate down uh, by uh, Oxford and into Topsfield, and eventually down to Danvers. Connection at Danvers would be made with the Danvers Railroad, as we've mentioned, and that was to build from there out to what became Wakefield Junction in Wakefield, and there uh, you'd have the connection into Boston, uh, directly over to Boston and Maine. And that went out through Peabody and Linfield. And in Peabody and West Peabody, actually, they crossed another railroad, uh, which was going from Salem to Lowell. And in Danvers, you crossed another line, which was going from Salem to Lawrence. So you had all these interconnected things when it got down there. Building the Danvers in Georgetown actually started in an area of Topsfield called Coal Rain. That was a Coal Rain Road right over here. So we assume that's probably the Coal Rain section of Topsfield. So that's where they actually started work, and then they worked in both directions, north and south. Were all these tracks standardized, so uh, one line? Yeah, they were all basically standard gauge lines, which was four feet, eight and a half inches. And that dates all the way back to the width of Roman chariot wheels. Just so with the boss is asked. Basically, right. Uh, the man who was selected to turn the first shovel full of earth on this project for the start of the Danvers in Georgetown was a gentleman named Benjamin P. Adams. I don't know what he was or why he was chosen, but anyway, he's the first one that, that, that took the shovel and tossed out the first shovel of gravel. And in a book that I read, as of 1910, that shovel that he used was still in existence. He didn't say where, but still in existence, we assume, somewhere here in Topsfield. And I've talked to several people, nobody's heard of it. But if it was important enough to keep from uh, 1853 to 1910, it would seem that somebody must have been bright enough to save it after that. So out there somewhere, there's a missing shovel. So keep your eye out. It's probably my <coughs> or something. Um, Irishmen were used to do the grading. There were a whole bunch of them brought in, and they had 50 wooden two-wheeled tip carts uh, to move gravel with. There was no power equipment of any kind. There were no steam shovels or anything. This was all done by hand. If you walk along the, the trail out here or any of the rest of it, you'll notice there's a lot of embankments that are pretty steep and pretty high. And there's some cuts involved, especially down just north of Putnam. 
tip cards and horses. It was unbelievable. It took place in less than two years. They were all done. Just amazing. As work began on the grading, uh, there was a gentleman along the, the right of way, and uh, he didn't like the coming of the railroad. He thought this was, this was a terrible thing to happen to this rural neighborhood. And he lived right next to it. And one day he thought, well, you know what? I'm going to make a statement. So he went out one day, bright and early in the morning, and got in front of the graders, and he sat down right in the middle of the right of way. He was a big man. He was well over 200 pounds. Folded his arms and sat there and defied them to come past. Well, the head of the grading gang was a gentleman named Meade, and he proved to be up to the task, and he walked over and tried to reason with the gentleman. He wasn't having any of it, so Mr. Meade walked around behind him, picked him up under the arms, lifted him off the ground, deposited him over the fence back onto his own property, and the work went on. So he had disgruntled folks that, that uh, tried to stop or slow down the work. The Irish workers, uh, first of all, lived upstairs in the Topsfield Range, uh, and then as work progressed in both directions, uh, they actually built shanties along the line and uh, lived in those as, as they went on. One of the, the Irishmen supposedly was murdered here in town. Don't have any more information than that. Uh, no, no stories about it, but supposedly somebody was killed uh, by somebody else. But that's all we know. By August 19th of 1854, the railroad was nearing completion. A newspaper reported that, quote, the whistle of an engine has for the first time disturbed the quiet slumber of our village, end quote. So that's the first time a steam locomotive whistle was heard in town here. Quite a thing. By August 31st of 1854, enough of the line was complete that a special train was run and it took a, a bunch of people, 150 of them actually, on a picnic uh, to Little's Grove up in Georgetown. Does anybody know if there's still a Little's Grove in Georgetown? That sound familiar? I guess not. Anyway, that's where they went. Uh, Mr. Warren Nichols was the engineer, and he worked for that line for many years. Uh, another early engineer was a gentleman named Ellis Dorman, D-O-R-M-A-N. And the locomotive used in construction of the line was named Baltpate, and uh, it probably was also used on this uh, excursion train, this picnic special, because it would probably have been the only engine they had at that point. The entire line was open to Wakefield on September 1st, 1854. In other words, it was complete, but actual service didn't start until October 23rd of that year. And a trip from Boston to Newburyport by this route uh, took an hour and 34 minutes, according to the early timetable. And that's opposed to uh, roughly an hour and 15 minutes if you went down the eastern road out here along the coast. So it was a little slower, but not that much, not really. And initially, four passenger trains ran each way every day except Sundays, and there were no trains on Sundays because you were supposed to be in church. So there were no trains run on Sundays, freight or passengers. The first bridge over the Ipswich River down here uh, was washed out by a storm in February of 1855, and that shut the railroad down for almost a month while they replaced it. And uh, I should mention that neither that bridge that washed out or the one that replaced it is the one that's there now. That's a much later bridge that probably came in the early days of this century. Topsfield was also a water stop, and by that we mean a place where locomotives could take on water because they used huge amounts of water to generate steam, more water than fuel, actually. So at many places along the way, they would have water tanks. And the one here in Topsfield was supplied by a spring from Price's Hill. Does anybody know where Price's Hill is? Yeah, I know where the OK. All right, good. Where is it? Where is it? Who lives in That road between the old man and, and Foster. Foster. Yeah, Foster. Foster. Between Foster and then he put that road, that's a right away up to the well for that. And that's where it came from. For the railroad well. All right. Yeah. Excellent. Be sure that you write that down somewhere because <laughs> that's one of the things we want to know. I'm sure it's on the deed. Okay. <laughs> Anyhow, this was a place where they stopped for water, and towns which had water tanks with trains stopped for water became known as 
tank towns. Okay. They were also known as jerkwater towns. And both of those became derogatory terms because of like a low class part of town. And jerk water simply meant when you stopped under the water tank, it was a big metal spout. You pulled that down into the, the hatch on the back of the tender where the water went, and then you pulled a chain to open the valve to let the water out, so you were jerking water out of that tank. So jerk water and tank towns became synonymous with that. Eh, don't want to live down there. That's a bad place to be. <coughs> we talked about a couple of the early crewmen. Uh, there was a conductor also named John W. Pillsbury, another named Batchelder, <coughs> uh, a gentleman named Joe White, who was an early brakeman, and uh, William Smith was an engineer, James Carey was a fireman. And we should mention for anyone that doesn't know, a fireman on the railroad is not like a firefighter in town on a fire engine today. A fireman on a locomotive is his job to stoke the, the boiler. <coughs> with wood in the beginning and coal later on to maintain a full head of steam to make sure that the water level in the boiler was adequate so the boiler didn't explode. And also he was responsible for looking down the left side of the engine for obstructions on the track, signals or what have you, and relaying those back and forth between himself and the engineer on the right hand side. So he had a pretty, pretty full job. Again, not everybody liked the railroad. There was a Topsfield man, again, who, even though he had received a substantial amount of money for his land that they took for the right-of-way, uh, nevertheless didn't care much for the whole idea because it now separated his property. And he attributed every calamity that he could think of to the coming of the trains. If he so much as found a dead chicken in his hen house, he'd take that chicken down to the railroad's lawyer and try and get damages for it. And so you can imagine he wasn't too popular with them. He also, of course, had a, a reserved right-of-way across the tracks from one part of his land to the other. He would always time crossing it so that he was right there when a train came by, so that they'd have to stop so he could make his way across the track. So needless to say, the crews weren't too happy with him either. The first 14 months totals for this entire railroad now that's all together and running, uh, ending October 31st, 1855, Total passengers carried 110,036. Passenger train miles run, this is the total train miles for passenger trains, 63,584. Freight trains, 12,480. So you can see there was quite a disparity between people carried and freight carried. There wasn't a whole lot of business out here for freight. Total mileage of 76,064 for 14 months. Combined receipts for passenger and freight carried amounted to $50,875.91. Again, doesn't sound like a whole lot today, but it was big money back then. Expenses were $35,093 for a net earning of $15,782.91. However, interest on funded and floating debt amounted to $15,369.43, and you know what's coming leaving a net balance of $413.48. This is 1855, but things were supposed to be profitable, and this thing was already headed down the dumper. Richard, was ice from Hood's Pond transported by the rail? I don't think so. Initially, the right-of-way was supposed to have gone right past Hood's Pond, but at some point they changed the plan and, and moved it over this way more. And a lot of folks were disgruntled by that because they hoped to make a killing on the ice business. It didn't happen. Don't know any more about it than that. In any event, the New Report Railroad, as all this conglomeration of four lines became known, was leased to the Boston and Maine in 1853. And of course, they had wanted it so they could tap into the Eastern Railroad's territory in New Report, take away a lot of their business. And of course, immediately the Eastern Railroad cut their freight rates in half and also the passenger rates to a, a, a lower fare than what the BNL was charging here. Over several years, the two railroads, the B&M and the Eastern, spent over $2,500,000 fighting each other over this piece of territory, which was just insane because there was nothing here anyway. Eventually, in 1884, the Boston and Maine took over the Eastern, which at that point had become bankrupt, not because of just this nonsense, but because of the infamous Revere train wreck in 1871 in which many people were killed, in which the Eastern Railroad was held entirely liable and the losses generated by that 
essentially bankrupted the company. So by 1884, uh, the B&M had taken over the Eastern. And by the way, over the years, the B&M absorbed over 150 separate railroads to make up the Boston and Maine system that we do at the end. From these little tiny you know, two-mile railroads up to big railroads like the Fitchburg, the Boston and Lowell, Eastern, uh, Concord and Montreal, big lines like that. So they had over 150 that made up the eventual Boston and Maine uh, up before 1915 when it started to recede. So in any way, uh, by 1884, this became a back line. This became a secondary line, because now you know, the eastern of the Boston Main Western Division route, two express routes north, this was just redundant through here. So immediately the BNM began to downgrade service and, and, and uh, ran much fewer trains, many fewer trains. And by September 28, 1906, they issued $306,000 in bonds to acquire title to the new report railroad outright, which then ceased to exist as a separate company. As time went on in the, in the 20th century, they kept going to the regulatory bodies trying to abandon the service on this line because it was just costing them an arm and a leg and, and there was just no business. Eventually, they allowed them to uh, cut back the line from Newbyport to Topsfield, and the last train to run all the way through uh, ran on December 13, 1941. Uh, mobile type engine like this one here, uh, number 1464 was the engine used. It was just like the five o'clock commuter train out of Boston. There was no special thing. There were a few people got on just to say they'd ridden it, but there was no hoopla or no fanfare. It tied up a new report, and that was the end of it. Uh, Timothy Hawks of Danvers was the engineer that particular run. Um, the rails were torn up back to Topsfield, and uh, the line to Bradford, which came down into Georgetown from up, up there and ran through Groveland, had actually been severed some four years earlier because of flood damage, which washed out a bridge uh, up in the western area of Groveland. So that line had already been severed. However, they maintained freight from Bradford down to the what became the Haverhill Boxboard Company. Uh, and that continued for three quarters of a mile or whatever it was down into there and just below Haverhill Bridge. And that service actually continued into the 1960s when they finally switched over to trucks. Passenger trains continued to run to Topsfield uh, until after World War II, and then that was cut back to Danvers. And uh, the service to Danvers ended in 1958. So at that point, if you wanted to go to Boston by train, you had to drive to Salem, or you had to drive to Beverly and get the train there. So that was the end of it. Freight service, however, continued on, and uh, they went up to the, the end of the track here in town. There was a siding there, and the freight house, and uh, the co-op had several boxcars of uh, grain and hay and whatever delivered every week. And in the last days, you had a uh, Pyrofax gas facility over here on Route 1. And they'd no sooner than put that in, it seems, than next thing you know, that was the end of the railroad. So all that for nothing. You know what year that was? Uh, that would have been probably about 74 or 5, something like that. Um, the two customers were obviously not enough to, to encourage the railroad to do any repairs on the track. The tracks were in terrible shape. And, uh, you know, they just said, you watch them, they were wobbling and went down through the mud and the pucker brush. It was just awful. So it was just a matter of time, and sure enough, they had a derailment in 1977 uh, over in the Putnamville section in Danvers. And nothing serious. I mean, a couple of boxcars went on the ground, and they came in, and, and the next day they got them all picked up and dragged them out of there and got the, end, got the uh, locomotive out. But shortly after that, the railroad embargoed the entire line north of Danvers. So that was the end of that. And, uh, it wasn't too long after that, in uh, 1981, that the whole line, along with all the Boston area commuter equipment and all the commuter routes, were transferred by the Boston and Maine uh, to the Massachusetts Bay Transportation Authority, MBTA. So that ended all service on, on this line forever. And uh, we're really glad that this line today has become a uh, rail trail because in so doing, uh, not only do you give something for people uh, that want to have recreational facilities for hiking, biking, what have you, 
you've also preserved this right of way. This is called rail banking. So it should, in the future, if you decided that it would be good to have train service out here in these rural areas, you could do it. The lines are going to be intact. There's not going to be a gravel pit dug in the middle of one or a house built on it or whatever. Uh, it's all still here. And this isn't likely to happen. Uh, I certainly don't expect to see it, although there's been talk uh, as close as Route 128 of perhaps having a park and ride facility and uh, you'd have the trains come from Salem up through Peabody and come to Danvers. But again, I wouldn't look for that anytime soon either. But in theory, all this is possible. So, uh, you know, that's the good thing about this. You've got these wonderful trails to use today and to enjoy and you've saved this wonderful resource for the future if we need it. We're extremely lucky that we have two original buildings from 1854. We've got the station at Boxford on Depot Road, and we've got the original 1854 Depot here in Topsfield, which is now a house over on Summer Street. And I don't know if you saw the display up front here, but we have actually the Topsfield Station sign from that building, which was preserved. Somebody had the forethought to stick that up in the attic. And when the house was, was removed and remodeled, they found that up in the attic, got penciled notes on it as to when the building was moved, how much it cost, how much it cost to remodel it, who did the work. Take a close look when you go out there. It's right on the little niche there as you go up the stairs. Wonderful. But other than these two stations and, and the right-of-way itself from the Iron Bridge down here, that's pretty much all there is left uh, of the railroad and Topsfield. We've got some pictures. We've got a little video, which you'll see in a few minutes. That's it. To the to record 123 years of train service here. Now, there's one other thing that I need to mention. Does anybody remember the Sideline Railroad? Does that strike a bell? I see all these blank expressions. Back in the 70s, there were four railroad cars down here on the side by the freight house. They were all antique wooden equipment from the turn of the century and even earlier. It was a mule-ended, double-door, wooden baggage car. It was an open-platform, wooden Laconia coach, day coach. It was a wooden <coughs> box car from probably around the World War I era. And it was a magnificent Boston and Maine wooden caboose. And somebody brought them in town and, and took a brush and wrote Sideline Railroad in great big letters on the side. Of them. I don't know who it was. I don't know what the idea was. But Eventually, that equipment got stuck up here after the railroad embargo of the line, so there was no way he could get them out of here. And eventually, the town fathers got fed up with seeing them down there. They became an eyesore. And one day, they went in with a front end loader and busted them up into killing wood. Except for the caboose, which I understood somebody said was trucked away. And I've never heard where it went to, but I think I've actually seen a picture of it being put on a trailer and trucked away. So hopefully, that survived. I never knew it, and it was just such a sad day when I came up here the day they broke them up, and it was just a great pile of wood and just the steel frames and the wheels. Yeah. And every one of those four cars was a historic car. It was probably quite valuable. And it would have looked great to have one of them down here now by that new building, just like they have the blood car out there at Bedford at the end of the Minuteman bikeway. It's a wonderful thing. But anyway, that didn't happen. Um, if anybody here is interested in, in a really detailed history of this line, there's a wonderful little book published by the Essex Institute in 1910. And uh, they only did 50 copies, so they're kind of hard to find, but I'm sure the, the Institute itself must have one. Um, it's called, quite simply, The History of the New Report Railroad. And it was written by a gentleman named Henry Follinsby Long, who lived here in town, in fact, is uh, buried up on the hill over here cemetery. He's up near the top if you go over there you can find his stone. And he lived from 1883 to 1956. And I think this may have been a paper for college or something because he would have been about the right age in 1910. And it gives the entire history, blow by blow, every bit of thing you'd ever want to know about this line. And it, it's, again, something published as the historic collections of the Essex Institute. But there were only 50 copies of you. Uh, the Historical Society has a copy. Wonderful. So now you know where to go if you want to see it. It's a marvelous little book. I have one. I don't book. It's five by eight paperback. Wonderful book. But anyway, that gives you about as much information as there is out there uh, on the report. Right?
So, with that in mind, do we have any questions? And what is a whistle stop, too? A whistle post? Whistle post. Yeah, it would be a cement post with a W in it. And that's to tell the engineer that there's a grade crossing coming up and he needs to blow the too long to shorten the long for the grade crossing. <coughs> that is also some posts on railroads that say R, that means ring the bell. If you're not going to blow the whistle, sometimes they just have the bell ring when you went over a street. And so what do you see an R? What did you say, the one that has the metal sign that's at a canted at an angle? No, oh, that's a, a flanger marker. In other words, it tells the crew of a snowplow that there's a street crossing or a switch or something coming up that the rails or the highway is up level with the railhead. And the flanger came down, it was a blade that came down between the rails to cut out all the ice and everything so that the flanges of the wheels would ride up and derail. All plows have those down underneath the center of the, of the snow plow car itself. Well, you didn't want that hanging down under there when you came to the road crossing, because you'd rip the thing out and possibly tear the blade off the flanger and derail the whole business. So they had this black metal pole with a yellow flag, piece of metal on it at an angle. And that yellow flag had two black dots on it. And whenever you saw that, cranked up the mechanism and got that thing up and broke the railhead so you wouldn't tear out the crossing or tear out the switch or derail the equipment <coughs> on three. That's what that was for. There's a couple of those out here. So those should all be preserved if possible and restored because that's all part of the deal. There's also a derailing shoe. Yep. Over by Amerigas. Yep. Yep. So that the car, if it got loose, wouldn't run out onto the main line. Yeah, I noticed that over there. Again, if, you, if down the road you could put some kind of a little marker there explaining what these things are would be wonderful. This private property, so we have to talk Well, to I'm sure you can talk to those folks. <coughs> good folks. Yeah. Anybody else? Yes? You mentioned rails trails would preserve the bed, mm -hmm. but possibly future uh, commuter service. Mm -hmm. Who would be interested, if it wasn't done, the rails trail, in the railroad bed itself? Nobody, right? Well, lots of times you get a butters who mm -hmm. want to use the railroad for their own purposes. Uh, the, the line that comes down from Bradford down to the what used to be the box board company up there along the Merrimack. Um, there's a big cement block building built right across the right of way. Just plunked right down there. I don't know how they arranged that, but in any event, it's built right smack dab across the middle of it. So you couldn't put that back if you wanted to. But it wasn't their property. It's the railroad that's we, railroad. We don't know how that happened. Yeah. Anyone else? Okay, well, I thank you for your interest, and it's been fun being here. And uh, again, this locomotive, if you want to take a look at it before you go home tonight, uh, we had this loan to us from the Beverly Historical Society. Yep, and this uh, particular model was scratch built by a gentleman in Byfield named Charles Purinton. And uh, he was a machinist, and he built this locomotive about 25 or 30 years ago. And it's more than just a pretty engine. It actually runs. It run, burns coal. Uh, runs on about 100 pounds steam pressure. It will pull three or four people. And uh, it's, it's really the, the real thing just shrunken down, like you took a magic wand, and there it is. Uh, three quarters of an inch to the foot scale. So be sure and take a close look at that tonight. And now a brief video showing trains in Topsfield. Okay, here we are going to see a very brief film of excursion train and a Department of Public Utilities train in Topsfield in 1969 and 1973. Uh, this first image shows a Bud diesel rail car crossing the bridge next to Route 97 over the Ipswich River. Again, this is a Department of Public Utilities trip which was done every year to inspect the various branch lines. Uh, it carried a few officials and that was about it. And if you were lucky enough to find out when these things ran, uh, you could actually go and see them and that's what I did. I took a day off from work to do this. And here again we see the same bud car, uh, number 6212. Uh, crossing the Route 97 crossing uh, just above the Ipswich River Bridge. And here it is coming into the yard along Park Street in downtown Topsfield. Here we're next to the siding at the very end of the line looking across South Main Street. 
car zipping right across, totally oblivious to the fact there's a train coming, although he's not actually going to cross the street, but they didn't know that. And here we see the conductor and the engineer having a brief chat while they're stopped here, uh, right at South Main Street crossing. And just looking up the street, uh, you can see the building in the background here where the post office is today on Main Street. And uh, again, uh, this is RDC rail diesel car number 6212, which was a car that was often used for these trips because it had a small galley in the baggage section. Uh, here they are leaving town, leaving along the rail yard uh, next to Park Street and uh, crossing Route 1. And they would stop here and activate the crossing flashers. And taking no chances, the brakeman would also get out and flag the crossing as well. People weren't used to seeing that many trains here, so this is an extra safety precaution. Here they are approaching Maple Street, uh, just beyond the Topsfield Fairground, and uh, they aren't stopping, they're going right across, and there's a delightful sequence right here of a couple of kids in their backyard seeing this train and, and being so excited to see it. This is the excursion train that ran in April of 1969, carrying several hundred people on, on a tour of many branch lines in the Essex County area. And this is showing them arriving at Topsfield and uh, actually making a, a photo run-in where people got off and then took pictures as the train came back in. Here we're leaving town, crossing Route 1, and down in Danvers and at Putnamville. And again, uh, we see a picture uh, crossing uh, the Ipswich River Bridge. This was taken by another photographer of the same trip, so this is basically a duplication sort of of what we just looked at. But since there's so few images uh, of trains in Topsfield, we thought we'd include this uh, second piece of film footage uh, so that you can actually get a better look at this excursion train again in April of 1969 coming across Route 97, all the rail fans hanging out the doors taking pictures. There were about 350 people aboard that day. This was the last passenger train to Topsfield, and uh, it was something that uh, we didn't know if we'd see it again, but we didn't take a chance, and we made sure we rode it, and we had people chasing it, which is why we've got pictures both on it and uh, looking at it from the road. And here it is coming into Topsfield Yard, uh, South Main Street crossing in the foreground. And again, this is now a, a part of the parking lot and hiking trail. And here they are leaving town again, crossing Route 1, going southbound, uh, headed for Maple Street. You can see the flashes there, the Amerigas siding in the background. And the car is starting up again. And this is down near the Putnamville area, uh, big high fill down there near the Danvers High School. And again, uh, another piece of film footage uh, showing this same train coming in, different from what we saw, the same train.